I'm reading to you from Colossians 2, verses 9 through 15. This is where the drama major thing comes in really handy. <clears throat> For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you have also been circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sin, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When we talk about identity, the, the place we have to start is with this truth that we have been given the fullness of Christ. So, I mean, that sounds pretty good. Sounds good to me anyway. The question always is, of course, what the heck does that mean? So we look further into the scripture. What does it say? We have put off the sinful nature. The sinful nature no longer defines us. It no longer enslaves us. We continue to wrestle with sin. We're human beings but it's no longer our identity. In 2 Corinthians verse 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So that old nature, the sin nature, that ruled in us, where we are always saying to ourselves, why do I do those things? I don't want to sin and I do it anyway. That nature has been defeated by Christ and no longer defines us. It says as well that we've been forgiven. All of our sin. Not just some of our sin. Not just most of our sin. All of our sin. Even that sin that makes us just so disgusted with ourselves. Even that sin we've hidden forever. We, <laughs> we, um, we were in Indonesia for 15 years. And we traveled a lot for our ministry. And so one, one time we were on the island of Sulawesi and we were doing a training there, and we were staying with this delightful older couple that, if you can imagine, they were older than us, older than me, um, still walking, taking food. Um, <laughs> and well, as we were getting ready to leave, they asked Tom, they said, Mis Mr. Tom, could we, could we talk to you? And they're kind of like that. Could, could we talk to you about something? And Tom and I both knew immediately what this was going to be about. Sex, right? So we sat down with them, and they, and they looked like this, and they wouldn't meet our eyes, and they finally said to, to us, Mr. Tom, uh, before we were married, <clears throat> we, well, we, well, we got carried away, and we went too far, and we had sex, and we knew we shouldn't do that because God doesn't want us to do that. Oh, Mr. Tom, we shouldn't have done that. And Tom's like, how long have you been married? It's like 40 years, they've been married 40 years, they're still feeling guilty about having sex before they got married, right? God forgave that sin. They didn't have to keep living in that sin 40 years later. Tom said to him, have you confessed this sin? Oh yes, Mr. Tom, we've confessed this sin. Then in the name of Jesus Christ, I say to you, your sin is forgiven. Oh, thank you. I'm like, glory be. Whew. God has already forgiven all of our sin. He'd forgiven that sin. They just hadn't received it. It says in Romans 8, 1, that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you hear that voice going, oh, you did it again, that is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. There is no condemnation now for us in Christ. We're no longer bound by legalistic requirements. What? Good news. I have to say that it's good news for me because I have a really hard time following the rules. Everybody here is a little nervous because I asked him, what happens if I run over? <clears throat> anyway, we, 
we'll try not to find out what happens if I run over. But we are no longer bound by those legalistic requirements. Jesus fulfilled those things on our behalf. So we don't have to be worried about the law anymore. He, he gave us a new law. You remember it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Way, way harder than that old law, but it's a new law, right? And we live it because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have been given the fullness of Christ. That's our new identity. The other thing that, that it says in this passage that is really good news is that we are no longer subject to the enemy. We actually have victory over evil spirits through Jesus. In fact, Ephesians 2 tells us in verse six that God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Okay, you guys do not look too excited. Let, let's think about this again. God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms and he has rule over every power Right? He's disarmed the powers and authorities and he's made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So that means we are in the same position. Yeah, that's good, go ahead. <laughs> Say amen, Jesus. So we no longer have to be afraid of the enemy. We no longer have to submit to the enemy. And in fact, one of my favorite things to do with the enemy is to tell him to shut up and leave me alone, right? Start practicing that right now. Uh, silently, please. <laughs> so this is the truth about us. This is what we are. And the other truth about us is that most of us don't live like this is true. I know that for many years I myself didn't live this way. How do we live? Well, some of us live from, from things that are easy to identify. You know, I'm the smart one, I'm the funny one, I'm the mature one in my crowd, I'm the one with all the answers, right? I'm the super Christian, <laughs> and I can pray for you, <laughs> right? We have these kind of identities, but most of us inside have another identity, and usually that identity is something like this. I'm a sinner, and I come into God's presence with my head down, because I am so ashamed of myself. And the voice of the enemy is strong. When we live under the identity of sinners, we live under a load of guilt and shame. It makes it difficult for us to approach God, especially if we're caught in a cycle of sin. We also live with this identity of the, of the people pleaser or the God pleaser. If I just work hard enough, right? It, it, if I follow all the rules, if I'm there every Sunday, if I volunteer, if I give money, if I pray good, then everything will be okay, God will love me, I'll be at peace with who I am because I know I'm all right. When we were on Java, still early on in our journey there, we were going to Sunday school with our kids because like, they were the minority there, these little white kids who didn't really understand Indonesian, and so they would go to class and feel totally like fish out of water, so we would go with them to help them understand what was going on. And I remember one day we're, we're in class and this, uh, sorry, that just turned an Indonesian in my head. A Sunday school teacher said to the kids, Oh, adi adi, Tuhan mengasihi anak-anak yang rajin ke gereja. Can you believe she said that? <laughs> what that means is, Little brothers and sisters, God is so much in love with children who go to Sunday school. There's truth in that. God loves children that go to Sunday school. He also loves children that don't go to Sunday school and have never been to Sunday school, right? But that's the kind of message we get. If I just do it right, if I just go to Sunday school, if I just, then God will love me and I'll be okay. But we never get it right. That's another part of our identity. This, this belief that I never get it right, I try and try and try, but I never get it right, is usually paired with striving. I'm gonna work really hard, I'm gonna figure it out, but there's always that feeling of despair and hopelessness, I just can't do it. I keep trying and I just can't do it. So my identity in Christ is actually, I've been given the fullness of Christ, but I'm sitting there saying to myself, oh, when am I ever gonna get it right? 
We all have those tapes that run in our heads. We're, I'm just rejected, I'm condemned, I, I'm stupid, I'm worthless. There's something, just, there's something wrong with me. And we are usually full of shame. I think that my experience growing up was fairly common for people who grew up in the church. I knew from a very young age, when I was just a little, little girl going to Sunday school, I knew that Jesus loved me because the Bible said so. Right, and we sang that song. I would sing it for you, but I think we all know it. I knew God loved me, but I also felt more like a stepchild than actually God's child. I knew that I had a place in the kingdom and the family of God, because they told me so, but I didn't really feel loved like those other children, because God seemed to answer their prayers, right? They got the interesting gifts. Oh man, how many of us have wished we got like the gift of prophecy? or healing, instead of administration. <laughs> Nobody ever prays for that, did you notice that? Oh, Jesus, send me the gift of helps, I want to. No, it's always like the healing, Lord, the tongues, the exciting stuff. We wanna be those kids that God really loves the best, right? That's how it felt growing up. He seemed to favor other people more. So I knew that he loved me, but I also kind of felt like he loved other people more. It's kind of like in the Bible. He loved that David guy more than anybody else. I couldn't ever figure that out because David seemed like kind of a whack job sometimes, <laughs> right? I mean, stuff he did, glory be, but God really loved him. So this brings us to the question of, you know, why is there such a difference between what the word of God says about us and what we believe about ourselves? And the problem is that we have an enemy of our soul. Now you all are thinking, yeah, Satan, okay, yes, but there's also the world, and there's also what we often call the flesh. You've heard of the evil triumvirate, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. When we talk about spiritual warfare in our ministry, we're talking about all three of those things because they're all warring against our souls. It's not just all like the devil did it all. It's also, what's happening around us. The world gives us messages that are easy to hear, right? We ought to look like that supermodel. We ought to be able to bake like the star baker. We ought to be wealthy, intelligent, uh, important, accomplished. These are the things that give us value. These are the things that bring our identity. So the first question that we ask people when we meet them is, so what do you do? Correct? I mean, that's where we always start. What kind of job do you have? What's your major? I used to tell people drama major, and then they all be like, okay, yeah. I've heard of you people. <laughs> Many churches have similar messages. You gotta be the, the upfront person. You gotta be the person with the flashy gift, the, the good prayer. If you're the person who sets up the chairs on Sunday morning, somehow you don't have as much value as the rest of us. You know, and sometimes actually it's not the church telling us that, it's just our hearts telling us that. If I was just like that worship leader over there, then I would feel like I really had value, that I had identity. And of course that worship leader is going, oh, if I just was the senior pastor, everything would be good in my life, right? Okay, so sometimes we're listening to the world, sometimes we're listening to the church, sometimes the church actually is telling us that thing about the fact that we're sinners. Sometimes the church is saying to us, you know, you're just a screw up. And you need to be on your knees before the Lord all the time. You're totally depraved. Again, there's some truth in this. We know that we sin, but this is not our identity anymore. In addition to the world, we have what, what we call the flesh. And we condemn ourselves all the time. I'll have to tell you a little of my story, because I struggled with identity when I was younger. When I was really young, we moved around a lot. Every time my dad, my dad was, worked in insurance. People always say, what, were you in the military? When they heard how many times we moved, and I'd be like, no, we were just in insurance. And every time my dad got a promotion off, we'd go to a new city. And so I was always having to break into new groups and new schools, but that was okay, because I had my identity. I was the smart one. Taught myself to read in kindergarten. It's always the teacher's pet. I hate to admit it, but it is true. 
The problem was that kind of identity can get broken pretty easily. If there's someone else in the class who's smarter than you, or if something happens to prove that you're not quite as smart as you thought you were. And that's what happened when I moved from Florida to Illinois. Because in Florida, I didn't learn multiplication. Now that may not seem like a big deal to you, but when you're in third grade and you're moving to fourth grade and the fourth grade that you moved to already knows multiplication and you do not, you're gonna be in big trouble. The first day back in, in school, the teacher gave one of those little quizzes to review what you forgot over the summer, and I failed it, because I didn't know anything about multiplication. This was not good news to me. It really shook me, and in fact, since then, I have not been able to multiply. <laughs> Tom will tell you it's true. He never let me keep the checkbook. No, I had a problem with numbers from then on because I just, in my heart, I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? What happened here? In addition, there was this one girl in my class, I will not tell you her name because she's probably out there somewhere Listen to this, <laughs> or not. But anyway, she was a bully and she chose me as her target. I can only imagine because it's because I was so wonderful and she was jealous, but nonetheless, everybody else in the class followed her lead to the point where I had no friends I was the outsider, I was bullied, I was teased mercilessly, and then the worst happened. We, oh, this is like back in the dark ages. When, when I was young, they used to give us a tuberculosis test every year to see if we had bumped into anybody with TB. Is that weird or what? But they would prick your skin and put some stuff in it, and then if you had been exposed to TB, the thing would like balloon up. It was not really very pretty, it was kind of, Scary looking, actually. And so I'd never had this happen in, in Florida, but when I moved to Illinois, they did it. And so when they, when they gave me that shot, man, it was, oh, it was big. And when my nemesis saw that thing, she started screaming, run, run, you're gonna die, you're gonna die. Now, that may sound kind of funny right now, but when you're like 10 years old and you go out on the playground and every single person on the playground runs screaming from you, it begins to make an impression. And the impression that I got was that there was just actually something wrong with me. And between failing at math and, and, f and watching everybody flee from my presence, I began to get the idea that there was something that just wasn't right. That, that whole thing kind of came home to roost when I got into high school and I had to drop algebra trig because I was getting a D. <laughs> And so there went the whole identity as the smart person out the window, and from then on my identity kind of became that person who couldn't get it right. The person who was always trying to figure it out and always have a lot of self-condemnation. How can you be so stupid? How did you miss that? Why did you? The, the funny thing is, of course, objectively I was doing well in school, but it didn't feel that way, I didn't see that. All I saw was the things that I was doing wrong. So that's the flesh, the, our own flesh can say these things to us. And then, of course, there is the devil. The enemy is ready to prevent us from finding our identity in Christ. He is always working against that. He loves to destroy our understanding of who we are, to underscore our self-condemnation and self-loathing. If you're saying to yourself, I am so stupid, he's going, yeah, you really are. Don't forget this time and this time and this time and this time. And how could you have said that? To that voice that you hear in your head, that's not necessarily your own voice. Listen to it sometime. And then tell it to shut up and leave you alone. You don't have to listen to it. All right, getting back to the devil. Jesus said of him in John 8, 44, he's a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So whenever you hear a voice that is not yours and not Jesus telling you stuff, you can know for a fact that it is a lie because the enemy is speaking it and he does not know how to speak the truth. His voice is the one telling us we're stupid, unacceptable, worthless, sinful, whatever it might be. He especially loves to condemn us in our walk with the Lord, to show us the difference between what we know we should be doing and how we actually live. So, why do we begin to believe the things that this triumvirate says about us? Usually it's because of the experiences we have, like I had as a kid in elementary school. We interpret what happens to us, and instead of being able to go, man, those kids are jerks, 
And oh, well, I just didn't learn how to do multiplication. In my own heart, I'm interpreting, man, there's something wrong with me and I'm really stupid, okay? The other thing is sometimes people tell us these things straight out. I don't know how many of you grew up in a home where your parents were telling you, you're never gonna amount to anything. How could you get that wrong again? Don't even try, you'll, you'll, you, you won't succeed. Those kinds of things enter and become ruling truth for us. Oh, glory be. I didn't want to go over, but glory, now I am going to go over, unless I just cut that right out. I'll talk about it later. So let's talk about this. <laughs> the problem with these deceptions is that we know, we know the truth. You all can tell me Bible verses that say you are loved by God and that you have been raised and seated in the heavenlies or whatever the heck, you know your identity, but your heart's going, well, that's all very well and good, but mm -mm, not really. We live from that place. I may know the truth here, but if it hasn't come here, then I'm in big trouble. So what are we gonna do about this? How do we get the truth from our head into our heart? How do we overcome the deceptions that we believe? Well, when Tom and I do ministry with people, we have a process that we go through. And the, the first thing about this process is that the first thing you need to do is learn how to listen to God. And that involves sitting with him. Usually, you know, as evangelicals, we pray and we're all like, oh God, here's what I want and here's what I need and thank you very much, I'm out of here. But when we really pray, when we're really communing with God, it's gonna take a little time and it's gonna be a matter of sitting and, and, and coming into his presence and then being open to hearing what the Holy Spirit says. So we sit down with God and we say to him, why do I believe what I believe? When did it start? What happened? Can you remind me of these things? Was it, was it relationships? Was it events that took place? And we allow the Lord to speak to us, the Holy Spirit to show us or to remind us. Often people will have memories we can say, oh, I didn't think about the fact that when I was in fourth grade, everybody rejected me and told me how stupid I was and ran from me and screamed, you're gonna die. Okay, that might have an effect on how I feel about myself now. Then we ask the Lord to show us, what is the truth? What do you have to say about that God? What do you have to say to that little girl who was standing on the playground going, what, what, what's going on? And again, we listen. Sometimes we have to forgive those who hurt us. I had to forgive those kids. I mean, they were all being jerks, but I don't want to hold them accountable for that 40 years later. So I forgive them, I release them to the Lord. And then I had to reject the lies that I learned during that time. At, at that point, I had to stop letting a bunch of 10-year-olds define who I was. Finally, I had to choose to embrace the truth and to ask the Holy Spirit to really plant that truth in my heart so that I could start living from it. And then the last thing I did was rebuke the enemy. I told him, you're done here. I don't believe these things anymore. You have to leave me alone now. You have to go. Any spirit that's been involved in that. You know, the struggle for me to believe that I was beloved, that God continued for a lot of years. I grew up in a home where I knew my father loved me, but he worked hard. And we knew in my home that if we wanted anything kind of relational to happen, we would go to my mom. So it, it looked kind of like this. You know, we'd all be sitting around having uh, an after-dinner conversation, and my dad would be in the corner with a card table with the work that he brought home, and that was his way of spending time with us. So when I became a believer, I, I believed that God felt the same way about me that he loved me, but he wasn't really quite there for me, and he wasn't that interested in the day-to-day -day stuff. Now, I know that is not true. That is not what the Bible says. It, it tells us about God's care for us. It tells us how he's intimately longing for us and calls us, and I mean, it just goes on and on. So how come this and this were not agreeing? Because in my heart, I really believed I was a stepchild in the kingdom of God. So finally, um, I asked for prayer for this. Tom and I were at a training. We were in Australia. And we were at a training to learn how to, uh, to lead small groups in doing inner healing prayer, the kind of stuff we're talking about. And I asked the women in my group to pray for me. 
And the Lord did a really beautiful thing. This doesn't happen to me often, but he gave me a picture, he gave me a vision. And in this vision, I was a little girl. And, and it was bedtime, and Jesus was helping me get ready for bed. So he helped me get my jammies on, you know, and then he helped me, we went in the bathroom, and he helped me up on the little stool, and he put the toothpaste on my toothbrush, and I was brushing my teeth, and he was helping me wash my face and comb my hair, and the whole time I was talking to him, except when I was like brushing my teeth and spitting, I shut up, but I was talking to him the whole time, and I was telling them all about my day and all the interesting things, and I was asking him questions, and he was listening to me, he was listening to me, and he was answering my questions, and he laughed at all the good parts where he was supposed to laugh. It was really fun, and so then he took me back in the bedroom, and he helped me get in bed, and he tucked me in, and I said, my God blesses, uh, God bless mommy, daddy, and all that stuff, and then I said to him, okay, Jesus, it's okay, now you can go, because I'm just going to go to sleep, and he pulled out a rocking chair, and he sat down next to the bed, and then he reached over and he turned the light down really low, so it's like a little night light in there. And then he said, I don't have anywhere that I need to go, and I don't have anywhere that I would rather be than right here. The rest of the evening, we, we were in worship, we had prayer time. The rest of the evening, whenever I would close my eyes, I would be back in that room. Jesus be sitting right there rocking, I was just sleeping. My heart was just totally overwhelmed with the love that God had for me in that moment. That was the truth. That's a picture of what he had. Not that I was some stepchild who he was sitting there going, well, I guess you can come in, but you know, I don't really love you that much. That changed completely the way that I saw myself. I was able to accept the truth that God not only loves me, but has given me everything I need to the point of overflowing to live a life that not only pleases him, but that is intimate with him. I began to actually believe what we were reading about, that I am filled to all the fullness of Christ. So this is where you know we land it. And I would really encourage you all to go through that process. Take some time to sit with the Lord. I know it'll feel weird. It feels weird at first. You're sitting there and you're like, mm-hmm, 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 waiting. It seems like forever. Then you look at the clock, it's been five minutes. It takes some practice. But sit with the Lord and ask him what you actually believe about yourself. And then ask him, when those beliefs started, what happened that led you to that direction? Then you can ask him, what does he have to say about who you are and how he sees you and how he's gifted you and the things he has created you to do and to be? And when he has spoken, choose to accept that truth and reject the lies. Rebuke the enemy and rejoice in your new freedom. Don't ever forget that you are Christ's handiwork, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has planned from before the creation of the world. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.